Good afternoon. Welcome to Door County Reads 2020. You know, outside of a dog, a book is man's best friend. Now you know this one? Inside a dog is too dark to read. Thank you, Groucho. Um, I've been saving that one for 13 years. Uh, and, and this is our 13th year of doing this. We did it. Yeah. We did three big reads, and then continued it with Door County Reads for 10 more years. This is our 10th Door County Reads, our 13th community read. And this year, we are celebrating a wonderful book, Virgil Wander by Leigh Pink. Um, I hope many of you have already started, maybe already finished, and passed it on to somebody else. Um, but if not, you've got about three weeks to finish up. So, um, here we are, and, and this is, for the first time, we have the author in attendance for the kickoff and, and ready to speak, uh, which I think is terrific, and so I'm going to keep my comments shorter than I usually do. Um, did, wait, did I hear the beginnings of applause again? Um, so, um, I, just to keep things moving here, right now I would like to introduce Jared Santek of Right on Door County and Tina Kukuski of Door County Library. to read the same book, of course, and then come together to discuss, listen, view, write, meet, and most of all, participate in events based on the book. Here's a brief listing of what we have in store for you over the next two and a half weeks. There'll be 26 free events, 11 official book discussions at locations throughout your county, and a whole bunch of unofficial book discussions, too. Four special presentations, including baseball in Door County, Great Lakes Surfing, music of Bob Dylan, and home is more than a place. There will be three oral history demonstrations, two writing workshops, two play readings, one film screening with discussion, one trivia with book discussion event, and one children's readers event, and of course today the kickoff and author visit. More information about these events is available by picking up a printed copy of the 2020 schedule. It looks like this. We have some out on the table in the lobby. It includes the dates, the times, and the locations. And copies are provided here today, and all of the Door County Library branches also have copies of the schedules. You can also go to doorcountyreads.org or the Door County Library Facebook page to get complete information and updates. And when you go to doorcountyreads.org, please fill out an evaluation about any of the events that you attend or participate in, because we value your opinion. Finally, the Door County Reads Committee would not be able to put all of this together without help from the participants, partners, collaborators, and sponsors listed in your program today. So please take a look and thank them when you are at their businesses or you meet them on the street. Especially the group that is uh, helping provide this event today, and they are the Door County Library Foundation, the Friends of Door County Libraries, Leslie Hill, Alan Kabishki, Jared Santek, the Sturgeon Bay High School, Peter Sloman, the Peninsula Bookman, Unique Flying Objects is providing our raffle kite today, the Sons of Norway, the Holiday Musical Motel, and the Rotary Club of Sturgeon Bay Charitable Trust Fund of the Dark County Community Foundation Incorporated. So I invite you to immerse yourself in Door County Reads 2020 and enjoy being part of the county-wide reading experience. Thank you. I'm Jared Santek, Artistic Director for Right On Door County. 
and we're very happy to be involved with this programming. Uh, six years ago, the very first program that Right On was able to do as our own nonprofit organization was the Dora County Reads program uh, book discussion up at our home in Jundal. So we're very happy to be a part of this. And it seems appropriate to be here in a high school auditorium to introduce Leif Anger to you. The first and only other time that I introduced him was in an elementary school gymnasium. He and his brother Lynn had uh, just published a crime novel under the name L.L. Anger and took part in the Loft Literary Center's fall publication celebration in 1994, my first year working there in our performance hall was an elementary school gym. So this many years later, Leif, we're still in school, and it's wonderful. Leif's debut novel, Peace Like a River, won the Independent Publisher Book Award and was named one of the best books of the year by both Time Magazine and the Los Angeles Times. His second novel, So Brave, Young, and Handsome, was a national bestseller. And today, we are happy to celebrate his third novel, Virgil Wander. There are years between his novel, which is a testament to Lake's craft and his dedication to get the story just right. Talking about his writing process, Lake said, My habit when working with a new character is to write tons of backstory. Where did they grow up? In what ways did they disappoint their parents? What's the gap between what they wanted and what they've accomplished so far? <coughs> Almost none of it will make the final draft, but it opens a window into their lives, suggests the origins of their language and habits, and gives me the sense they have things going on outside the book's horizon. So as you hear that, consider the fact that there are 75 characters in Virgil Wander. Even if the backstory is written for only a third of those characters, that is days, weeks, and months of writing that we as readers will never see. And in fact, readers might not have seen Virgil Wander at all. Leaf wrote an entire previous version of the novel and scrapped it as unsatisfactory. He didn't just set it aside to come back to later, he deleted it entirely. Other writers might have just stopped there. Fortunately for us, our guests did not. Please give a warm Dort County welcome to Leif Anger. I had no idea there were 75. <laughs> I did press the delete button. Um, and I, I hope, not only do I hope never to have to do that again, but I hope never to have to tell Robin again that I, <laughs> that I needed to delete the, the project that I've been working on for four and a half years. <laughs> uh, first things first, uh, thank you so much for coming out. And, uh, and thank you for selecting Virgil Wonder for your for your York County Read program. It's uh, it's incredibly gratifying to me. First and obviously, because what writer doesn't want some affirmation now and then? Uh, we all do, and very few of us uh, receive much of it. And so I, I I know that I'm a very lucky guy. Most of the time, being a writer is 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 a matter of um, people looking at you strangely or. Um, as if you were an adult kite flyer. <laughs> so being an adult kite flyer. Um, but also, there's this other thing, and I've talked with other writers about this. Um, a community read project, like being featured in a read project such as this one, it, it, um, it, it allows you a chance, a rare chance, to be part of something that feels to me like it's uh, kind of quietly um, gorgeous, uh, and sort of below the radar, which is the nature of books, below the radar. <laughs> um, and maybe
maybe even important in a, in a, in a hundred tiny different ways. And that is the idea that, um, that reading and writing, the acts of doing those things, um, are, are basically lit places um, in a dark landscape. So the act of reading a book or, or a magazine interview or, or picking up a pencil and writing something down when you think of it, um, those, are, those are little pools of light. And therefore, they are inherently optimistic. They're optimistic acts. C.S. Lewis said, uh, I read to know I'm not alone. And that kind of nails it. And obviously, that's why he wrote as well. It's why anyone writes. It's why all of us read. And of course, loneliness that he was kind of referencing there is different from solitude, which we need to get straight right away. Uh, I'm guessing that for most of us, the fact that we are gathered in Door County near the 45th parallel at the end of January <laughs> to talk about books, um, this means we're basically okay with solitude. <laughs> for some of us, this is the best time of year. I'll just be upfront about it. For me, this is the best time of year. For some of us, uh, empty streets just take the pressure off. Um, you know what silence is? Silence is the sound of happy <coughs> introverts. <laughs> uh, but one of the best things I think about, about solitude is the ability, whether or not we use it, uh, to, to connect at will with others, other people who are like us, other people who are different from us. Um, I think that what we have in common is the love for words and pages and paragraphs, that they are our tools and our signals, they're our secret handshakes. Uh, we, are, uh, we are midnight optimists, I think. I have this memory of, of, of riding in the back seat, heading to North Dakota in hunting season. I grew up in west central Minnesota, a little town called Osegas. I was the youngest of four, still am. <laughs> um, in the back seat with my brothers and my sister, uh, going west at night with a trunk full of uh, goose decoys and uh, long johns, not the pastries. <laughs> Three hour drive that seemed like forever the way a drive does when you're a kid. Uh, dead quiet because my dad didn't want to listen to stuff. Um, and it, Fair enough. I mean, during the week, Dad was a band director at the local K-12. <laughs> so it was a pep band and marching band and concert band and uh, daily rehearsals. Every week, my dad would give between 70 and 80 individual music lessons. You know, the kids squeaking out, go tell it on the mountain, <laughs> the clarinet. I mean, Dante wrote about this. <laughs> So fair enough, Dad did not, did not want to, he wanted quiet on the weekends, so we would get in the car and drive west to our grandparents' house and go, go hunting in the fall, late September through mid-October, just quiet in the car, and it, we wouldn't get started until late. So it was dark when we left, it was dark all the way, it was dark when we arrived at Grandma and Grandpa's house, and totally quiet. Uh, you remember the trance you fall into as a kid when you're, when you're driving at night and there's no noise in the car except maybe your mom spinning the lid off of a ball jar of water and passing it around. Um, you fall into this kind of trance, but in the back seat we would have this stack of comic books, classics illustrated. So comic renditions, do you remember, anybody remember these? <laughs> classics illustrated. You had, um, as comic books, Last of the Mohicans, and uh, Robin Hood, and um, you know Oliver Twist. Dickens scared the daylight. I thought Dickens was a horror novelist. <laughs> all, these, all these big, nasty adults beating the daylights out of little kids. And Dickens frightened me. I had a flashlight that I had been given for my birthday, and, and I could click it on in the back seat and read. 20,000 leagues under the sea as we were 
heading across the North Dakota prairie. Oh man, if that sounds excellent, it's because it was. And then it would get even better because once we got out of lake country and sort of started our way across the plains, then everything changed. The road flattened out, more of it was gravel, and, uh, and, and these farms would sort of loom up out of the night. Farms like the prows of oncoming ships. Um, and you'd see them, they all had the mercury lights or the sodium lights on the yard. And you'd see lights in the windows, living room windows, sort of barely lit, and you knew they were watching Bonanza, <laughs> uh, which we would be doing if we weren't on the road. And, and, and you'd see lights in kitchens, and people moving around in kitchens, and you'd see lights in laundry rooms. And I remember in particular one house that we would drive past. It was between Hankinson and Oaks. Never knew who lived there, but uh, there would be a lit attic every time. Sometimes you felt like there was nobody home, but that attic window was all open. And I'd be reading whatever classic comic, and I'd look up, and I always imagined somebody reading behind that attic window. And I could see their light, and I would imagine them up there and glancing out the window and seeing my tiny little light in the car. It's just like a moment of connection. And that was fanciful and romantic and lame. But then I was fanciful and romantic and lame. I loved those long drives in the dark. I still love those long drives in the dark. Which is a good thing since I live in Duluth now. We drive in the dark until April. <laughs> um, we, we are still new there, Robin and I. Um, new in, in Duluth. We moved there after 20 years uh, on, a, on a farm on a dead end road in Aiken County, Minnesota. Beautiful spot. Talk about dark nights. No light pollution at all. But after our kids um, grew up and moved away and got lives of their own, we realized that we wanted to be around more lit windows. We wanted there to be more windows behind which there were people. I was so surprised to realize that I wanted to move. I, I thought I'd probably just be happy until I was an old man, just, just living out there with nobody getting crankier and, and uh, grumpier and nastier. But instead, I kind of wanted some people around. So, so we moved, and I had forgotten how much work it is to, to move. And when you've been in a place for 20 years, you accumulate all this stuff. I took, I took 14 crates of books to the local library. 14 crates. Um, people kept uh, recommending Marie Kondo to us. <laughs> One of my oldest friends actually sent me her famous book about Tidy It Up. I passed it along to the library. I thanked it first. But the upside to clearing out your bookshelf is is that you get reacquainted by necessity with the books that you really adore. And I brought a few of those with me um, today because they make the case, I think, way better than I can, that um, reading and writing are, are acts of joy and connection and that they help you toward gratitude and curiosity and, uh, and away from rigid thinking and ignorance and want. Um, these are, these are my weapons against despair. So this is exhibit A. This is, this is Olaf Murray's field guide to animal tracks. <laughs> this, is, this is a great book. Uh, my brother Lee sent me this book when I was in junior high and he was a wild halibut fisherman in the waters of Alaska. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful field guide. It's, it's uh, drawings, it's got drawings of every animal track you can possibly imagine encountering in North America. If, if you go out and you are convinced that a California condor has landed on your deck rail <laughs> in the night and then flown off, this book will tell you what the claw marks look like. Seriously, they're in there. 
But what the guide stresses is not so much what the tracks look like as how to read them to discover anything that you can about the lives and thoughts of these animals that leave them. It's fantastic. So I will give you just a small taste. Oh, man, I, I was in seventh or eighth grade when I got this. I just obsessed over animal tracks for the next two or three years. On a wintry day, Olaus writes, in Wyoming as I was traveling along the foothills in open country, with aspen groves on the hills, dark evergreen forests above, and the Teton Mountains across the valley, I came on the tracks of a jackrabbit. Obviously, the animal had been in a desperate hurry. How desperate was soon revealed, for the rabbit track was joined by the track of a coyote. The rabbit had dodged deftly and fast. The coyote swerved too, but had slid in a wider turn. Again, the rabbit turned and the coyote swung in close pursuit. Time after time, this was repeated. The rabbit was doing well. Could he gain enough distance to escape by a speedy straightaway? Suddenly, there was a third track. A second coyote had been cruising along a little farther up the hill. His trail of long leaps led diagonally down just in time to close in with the jackrabbit made one of his desperate uphill turns. A few drops of blood here, and the two coyote trails led off together. <laughs> what you really get from this book, or what I got from the book, was, was uh, the wild creatures are, are actual individuals, by which I mean they care about their lives. Uh, we know this instinctively as kids, but we forget about it because their lives are, are lived invisibly to us for the most part. And it's great to be reminded that those creatures are out there cruising around with their sharp eyes and their sort of intact ambitions. Uh, fear, hunger, delight, romance. This book reminds you that you are a creature as well. One fall in deer season not many years ago, there was a great horned owl that, um, that surprised me my first morning out in the deer stand. And then all week long, it hung around with me. Um, if I climbed up a particular tree, this owl would find me and land 20 or 30 feet away and just keep an eye on me. If I climbed down and stalked through the woods looking for deer trails, it would follow and, and just sort of land a branch to branch and never be too far away, which was fascinating and it was a little eerie. Uh, I don't know what he was thinking. He was thinking something. I told my son John about it. He said, Dad, he was thinking about your liver. <laughs> One afternoon, uh, same woods, a uh, little cloud of chickadees swarmed around in the tree where I was sitting. Uh, for five or ten minutes, they, they landed on my knees and my shoulders, the top of my head. I could feel them on my hat. Uh, it was November, and I don't know if the weather had something to do with it, but you could, it was one of those days when snow was on the way and you could smell it hours before it got there. And these chickadees were just almost in a panic, but there was something really joyful about them. And I was really happy just to let them land on me. It was fun. I felt like I was part of things. Plus, I had just read a, a terrific novel by, by Carl Ove Nosgaard in which he uh, suggests that, that angels have slowly devolved since Old Testament times and remain with us in the form of birds. <laughs> And I'll tell you, when you're covered in chickadees, <laughs> it doesn't seem that far-fetched. Another time I was in the deer stand, I was, reading, uh, I was reading a book, and I was drinking a coffee out of a thermos. The book was Aunt Julia and the Scriptwriter by Mario Vargas Llosa. And I did the thing that a hunter is never supposed to do in the deer stand, and I laughed out loud. And then I heard my own laughter, and I looked up, and there were two does out in the clearing uh, watching me laugh. They were just a, just a nice pair of hefty does, probably sisters. They were having a good morning. I was having a good morning. Shooting were erected for everybody. <laughs> 
did start to wonder what was happening to me. Uh, because I really wasn't anxious to kill stuff anymore. Um, I wanted to be out there, but I didn't have the same intention that I, that I had had a decade before. Uh, and, and it wasn't just me. We had a dog then named Collie. Uh, man, one of the best friends I ever had. Um, the only trouble with Collie is that she was aging seven times faster than I was. Uh, the last few years, she would not even bark when deer came up into the yard. She just let it come, just watch them, just lay there in the shade. Sometimes they came right up to her to see her up and sniff, and she would just kind of enjoy it. What a good dog. The day Collie died, a, a coyote came up into the yard, just drifted up. Coyotes will just come up into your yard. They, they don't really touch the ground. They just sort of drift up. Their feet aren't even really touching the ground. And this coyote just sort of ghosted up into the yard and came straight to Connelly's dog food dish and ate what was left, um, which I thought was fantastic. We, we had a 40-pound bag, which we had just opened in the garage. And the coyote ate the whole 40 pounds over the course of about a month. Um, so there's another book that I couldn't give up in the move. And it was this, this wonderful text right here. Um, it's called How to Sail Around the World. And by the way, there are titles you can I wish I had written a book called How to Sail Around the World. I still want to write one called You Shall Be Eaten Last. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> anyway, Hal Roth, Hal Roth got to that title before me, and he wrote this tremendous book. It's basically a, it's a practical guide to just, to, to, you know, circumnavigating the earth on a small sailboat. Um, a life-changing book for me. Even though I've never sailed around the world, I'll probably never sail around the world. Uh, well, who can say? But I'll probably never sail around the world. And it doesn't matter because the book is a masterpiece. This is one of those books you open the cover and you just fall into it like it's Narnia. You just fall in. If you want to know how to catch rainwater in your sails and funnel it down to a waiting barrel for your later use, Hal Roth can tell you how to do it. If if you are worried about landing in a strange port where you don't know the language and somehow getting through customs, Al Roth will tell you how. If you want to know how to prepare a gourmet meal in a galley when the boat is pitching in 30-foot seas, Al Roth can tell you how to do it. Because he and Margaret went around the world three times in 40 years on their 40-foot boat. And then they wrote this marvelous book about it. Just distilled all their knowledge and wrote this book. I'm generous of them. Talk about a light and dark place. Uh, as usual, it's 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 not the uh, it's not the specific details that uh, that catch in your brain. It's it is simplicity and beauty that stick. And so out of this book, the, the passage that I really am dying to read to you is, is their account of Christmas 1973. On the day before Christmas of 73, we were at 38 degrees south in sight of the Chilean coast. We had small sails up and had been hammering south against a relentless headwind. At noon, Margaret climbed on deck to take the watch. <coughs> Go below and look at the chart and sailing directions, she said. I think we can anchor on the northeast side of a little island named Mocha. It's about 20 miles offshore, just south of us. By mid-afternoon, the wind was stronger. But we were reassured by the thin blue outline of Mocha on our starboard bow. Two hours later, we were in smooth water on the northeast side of the eight-mile-long island. In front of us were mountainous wooded slopes and we could see a tiny settlement of clevered houses. While the angry wind whistled overhead, we let out our anchor in a long length of chain a few hundred yards offshore. The next day, the wind blew even harder in the southwest. We were snug in our berth and made plans for Christmas dinner. While I fired up the stove, 
Margaret sent out a pan of bread dough for the first rising. She then consulted her storage book, burrowed in a settee locker, and pulled out a canned turkey, cranberry sauce, and a plum pudding her sister had given us a year earlier. Soon Margaret had everything cooking. Meantime, I strung up a line of silver paper stars at the tiny collapsible red and green Christmas tree that we have hauled around for half a lifetime. Ashore, there was no sign of anyone until the hour of a daily weather forecast that was mentioned in the Chilean pilot book. We watched a man enter a small building topped by various antennas. We turned our old battery-powered portable Zenith radio to the frequency, but heard nothing, absolutely nothing. All was ready by mid-afternoon. First Margaret and I drank a hot buttered rum, then we sang a few Christmas carols before sitting down to the steaming turkey, peppery dressing, tart cranberry sauce, candied potatoes, fresh bread, and of course the plum pudding. We said a prayer of thanksgiving for our good health, our happiness, our snug anchorage, and our faraway friends. The next day the contrary wind eased and we headed south again. Mocha Island, our Christmas island, was soon a blur astern. Oh, man. Just for context, uh, what Hal and Margaret knew and what must have made that anchorage extra sweet was that Mocha Island had also sheltered Sir Francis Drake 400 years earlier when he sailed around the world. And also the island was thought for many generations of native Chileans to be a stopover for fresh ghosts on their way west after death. That'll add some juice to your Christmas Eve. <laughs> uh, plus, best for last, the waters just off of that island had once been home to this magnificent, bad-tempered white whale that was obsessively hunted for several generations of whaling fleets. That whale at the time was called Mocha Dick. <laughs> That got Herman Melville's attention. <laughs> Gave him a book idea. So I love to think about Hal and Margaret Roth on the boat, reading their charts and their guidebooks and making notes. Thinking about the Chileans and Mocha Dick and Mr. Melville. Eating up some Christmas dinner out of a can. Uh, grateful for shelter and wondering how long that storm was going to last. I looked at, just for fun, I looked up Christmas 1973 to see what I might have been doing. I don't remember Christmas of 73. But what I found was um, a Christmas address given by Richard Nixon, who was feeling in battle. You know, you watch, you watch Nixon in this 1973 thing, and he, you can see the walls closing in. Uh, he looks like, he looks pale and sad like something that grows in your basement. He looked terrible. <laughs> in the meantime, here were Hal and Margaret, hundreds of miles from anybody in the happiest clans, reading their books. What's so cool about reading is it gives you a way to live that, that doesn't um, call for 24-hour intensity. Um, I don't think we're built for primitive warfare. To read for pleasure is to walk in the grass. It's good for you. It reminds you the world is big. It's this great Wendell Berry poem. I'm just going to read a few lines from it. It says, as soon as the generals and the politicos can predict the motions of your mind, lose it. Leave it as a sign to mark the false trail. The way you didn't go. Be like the fox who makes more tracks than necessary. Some in the wrong direction. I didn't realize until just this moment how many animals made it into this talk. <laughs> Not to mention their tracks. <laughs> I'm going to finish up uh, by reading a little bit from my own book from Virgil. Uh, it, it feels a little arrogant to read from my own work alongside the work of people I admire so much. 
Um, but it got me invited to come today, so, <laughs> so why not? Also, it fits in with this premise, this premise that reading and writing are, are by nature hopeful. Um, my cheerful confession is this. I, I only write what I badly need at the time. Um, here's what was happening while I was working on this story. Our kids were growing up and leaving home. Our parents, Robbins and mine, were getting sick and dying. We, we went through a period where we just lost a lot of people uh, through, through illness and distance and death and division. Just lost a lot of people for a while. And I mean, it's good to be at peace with solitude. <laughs> uh, but you, but you've, gotta, you've gotta keep your eyes open. Um, it's easy to, to suddenly look up and find that you are isolated. Writers always, always talk about writing being therapy. Sometimes it's more than therapy. Sometimes it's a, sometimes it's a rope ladder. So I'm going to read this this little section that that I wrote because I desperately needed. Funny, Rob. Many of you know a movie called Notting Hill. Yeah. Rob and I. Uh, we have, like most people do, a handful of favorite movies, and we, we have returned to that one quite a few times over the years. Um, it, Hugh Grant and Julia Roberts, and, you know, they're, they're great, but they are not what makes us return to that movie. What makes us return to the movie is that little cast of misfit friends that, that get together for dinner parties and, and burn the food and, um, and laugh long and hard about who has the worst life, who's the saddest sack among them. And, uh, and every time we watch that, Robin leans into me and says, can we have those friends? <laughs> For those of you who haven't read the book, Virgil, Virgil it owns this theater. He owns a movie theater called the Amber Sin is Dying to the North Shore of Lake And, uh, and, and, and he has sort of reinstituted with his friends this, this tradition of, after parties, where you show the, 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 the feature movie and then everybody leaves and then a few select people stay behind him. And he goes up and he grabs a movie out of the vault, an illegal print that he's not even supposed to have, and they watch it. And they have pizza or lasagna. They open up a box of Cabernet and they have an after party. That's how we reinvented the after parties. We started small. The first night, Nadine brought a lasagna in a quilted bag. Rune arrived with his windburned face, and Bjorn took projection as though the job were his all along. He picked out the lady killers from 1955, Alec Guinness as a con man with mule teeth leaning in the shadows. His nemesis is everyone's snowy grandma whose wily innocence is her sword and shield. You could fret all day and not choose a better picture. With its music box opening and Ealing Studios and jiggly letters, you don't expect much. What you get is sly as Bergman, but with less freight more fun to think about later. After that, the old band more or less reconstituted, with several new faces, of course. Lucy Dufresne, now flying kites with Rune almost every day, appeared in a fedora and turned up collar she seemed born to wear, kissing Rune, who blushed happily, pretending it was nothing. Don Lean showed up with an anxious expression and his ex-wife, Marcy, whom he was trying to win back. Tom Beeman appeared laughing as though this whole business had never stopped. He even landed a new girlfriend for the occasion, Connie Swale, a displaced hippie from a cannabis ranch outside of Beaver Bay. In the old days, I used to worry over the number of people who knew about the vault and its contents. This time around, it didn't matter. Soon, Bjorn invited someone, a girl named Ellen Tripp, whom I recognized as the waif sitting behind Lainey Plume's posse at the Empress. Just a kid of 15, Nadine told me. Got pregnant last year and had an abortion. Lost all her friends and her folks kicked her out, although she was back with them now. Ellen was working things through. One week she would show up as plain as a hymnal, eyes cast down and her hair yanked back. The next she arrived in glitter and paint, short and bright as a puffin. Regardless of dress, her most piercing weapon was a smile that burst out when least expected, as though too much to contain. 
Inside of five minutes, we all endured her. In fact, Ellen ended up choosing most of our movies. Bjorn wanted to show her the vault, and I couldn't think what not. Ellen was no cinephile and didn't need to be one. She loved the clandestine treasure cave vibe, the tarnished gleam of the canisters under the humming vault, falling hard for poetic titles. She selected accordingly, bypassing Spartacus, for example, in favor of Splendor in the Grass. There are better movies, but if you're choosing by title, that one's hard to beat. Conscious as we were, a few of us at least, that the after parties constituted an epilogue of sorts. We did our best to make them count. They grew rapidly into prodigal feasts. We laid a painted door across two sock horses for a table. Regular lasagnas were accompanied by loaves of ruined bread. We brought them down so hot from the oven they sat crackling as they cooled. Tom bought pies from Betsy Shane, usually three, one being raisin, which Tom would devour himself. <laughs> Don's former wife, Marcy, went full on with quiches and tarts, and one time a whole chicken braised in red wine, which changes the common bird forever. We ate before the show or during it, stood up or sat down in the ruinous seats, talked through the pictures, and gave in to their spell. Ellen often climbed up to sit with Bjorn in projection, but the crux of her orbit was Nadine, who treated her like Bjorn's provisional girlfriend. Certainly Bjorn was alert around Ellen, attentive and funny, doubtful with his hands, but it was also clear she spooked him, herself seeming 31 minute and 12 the next, but rarely the 15 she was. Sometimes she took his arm and held tight while not talking, not even glancing at his face. Meantime, our undisclosed parties became ever more disclosed. There isn't much to do in Greenstone. Word was bound to get out. One night after the regular show, a woman in a puffy down jacket skulked under the neon Bogart why, Julie, I said, outside of her usual context, the Agate Cafe. I didn't know her at first. I heard your show on classics in secret, she said in a rush. When the urge strikes, and for a limited time, I said, you're welcome to join us. Most of them aren't really classics, though. Next to inquire was Lily P., who came to my office asking about the midnight showings and why she hadn't been invited. A week or two later, Nadine sent her a text. That night she arrived with a chocolate cake for a screening of I, the Jury. Galen came, too. He seemed to enjoy the lurid vigilante plot. In this way, people poked and stumbled and demanded their way in. What does it say about Greenstone's social famine that goofy, unadvertised cinema can rouse any interest at all? Sometimes we got a bigger crowd at the after parties than at the legitimate screenings beforehand. Maybe they sensed that beyond the films and feasts, the Empress had begun to feel like a shelter, even an ark. Rain and sleet fell throughout the autumn. Day after day, oh, whoops, I've missed, a, I've missed a line. Greenstone was inundated with water and distressed animals. We had a foal explosion when the rodents left Florida, flooded warrens for high ground. On their scrabbling heels came weasels and mink. Day after day, the lake rose up. Fish gasped in the storm drains. The black rain throbbed on the Empress Rough and steep, seeped into zigzag down fresh painted walls. Drops gathered on the tin ceiling and fell with pebble velocity. Beeman took a big one on his bald spot, and it sounded like cracking a whip. <laughs> we set out buckets and waste baskets and kept the ark mainly dry, while the world outside, like Noah's, got more savage by the day. time for some Q&A, but I want to thank you for, again, for, for um, selecting this book for your community reading project and for showing up. Um, I, I can't state strongly enough that, um, that a project like this one, a literate project that involves people, um, this is exactly right for the times we're in. I have done um, just an immodest amount of traveling on behalf of this book. And every place I go, people have been kind. They have been unfailingly generous um, and decent, which I've realized is just a hallmark of people who read it. It's a hallmark of readers. It's also true, though, that um, there is more anxiety 
and spite and anger in the air that I can remember in my reasonably short life. Um, and it's events like this one that remind me that we have uh, the tools to get through it. Uh, we have words and therefore we have the capacity for uh, wit and persuasion and defiance when necessary and clarity and reason. Um, in, in A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens wrote this explicit and really scary warning about ignorance and love. But actually, that's what all of his books were up to. They were all trying to be the opposite of ignorance and the opposite of want. Dickens uh, cheerfully battled ignorance and want until the end of his life. And that, I think, is what you do every time you read a book. Every time you read to a kid, every time you pass one along. So I am grateful to you for having me today and for keeping those lanterns lit. And now if anybody's got something they want to ask or something they want to discuss or an unresolved anger issue, <laughs> at your disposal. Yes? The magic realism aspect, I know you say it's not exactly, but how did, how did that come into your life? How is it that you wanted to add that characteristic or element to your story? There's always something in, in anything I, I write that, that can be maybe described as magic realism, which is, um, I think that is just, uh, I think that's something I kind of, um, it's sort of second nature to me, and I think uh, that's the reason I'm writing fiction. Because, because in fiction, you're invited to use everything that's at your disposal. And so if, if I want to work a miracle, I can't do one with my hands. But I can do one up here. I can imagine a lot. Um, my imagination is, uh, is, the, is the largest thing I have. So I want to use all of it that I can as long as it remains readable and, and feels realistic. I don't think it's a bad thing to open yourself to, to the physically impossible. I think that's a really good thing. I think we imagine our way out of a lot of problems. So I, I don't want to limit myself to only things that can be thoroughly explained. I would feel bad if I did that. I'd feel incomplete. Yes, sir. Throughout the book, there's lots of death and destruction, which is dealt with mostly with humor and folksy sorts of thing. But the bomb. <laughs> what was your thinking about the bomb? <laughs> well, I, uh, we're, we're sort of deep into spoiler country. I would, how about this? Here's the compromise I will make about the alleged bomb. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I, I will say that um, that I'm happy to talk to you one-on-one -on -one after the um, and, and And also, I would say that if you have not reached the end, um, that there is a, there is a, a, there's an event that doesn't actually come out of the blue as much as it feels like. Um, I, I never, I never um, let anything detonate without lighting a fuse well in advance. <laughs> but I'm happy to talk to you after. Yes, sir? We're going to keep Jared running here. Your characters are all very lovable. What almost all? Almost all. <laughs> to what extent uh, are you deriving them from people you know? They're also strange, lovably strange. <laughs> to what extent do you derive them from people you know, or to what extent are you, do you grow them? 
You know, um, that's a really good question. Um, and the answer is that almost always I start, I'm inspired by somebody that I've met. Uh, but if I write about them for even a page or two, then they start to get their own feet under them and develop their own quirks and their own personality. Uh, so the answer, the short answer is that almost always I think, oh man, I remember interviewing this guy. And he was interesting. What a story he had to tell. So I begin with that. Um, and then they just, uh, you know, the creative process is so wonderful because if, if you just give a character their head, they'll do all kinds of things that you don't expect. And, um, and so they, they rarely lead you wrong. Just, uh, just give them their head and they'll, they'll tell you what's next. But often there is a, there is a, uh, a beginning. Well, for example, Virgil himself, um, he of the traumatic brain injury, um, was inspired. I, he's a lot like me. I mean, I won't be coy about it. He's a lot like me. Um, but one of my one of my greatest friends had a was in a car accident and had a, a head injury. And, um, it, it took her uh, years to recover. But what she lost right away was all of her adjectives. She could no longer describe. And, um, and that was a, a huge difficulty for her because she um, has a large vocabulary and loves to tell you about things. And, and suddenly she was frustrated and couldn't describe it. And, and different words would come to mind. Words that, that sometimes she made up um, out of whole cloth and would say this as though it were. And, and you could sort of make it. It was like, um, it was like speaking with somebody who doesn't really have English, and you uh, understand words through context. Uh, that's how it was with, with her for a while. And so um, I was just beginning my rewrite <laughs> after I'd hit the lead on the first draft. And, uh, and I had this new character, Virgil, who was telling the story. And I thought, wouldn't it be splendid to just re remove part of, of what makes him who he is and let him rebuild? Because that's what my friend was doing. I, I paid a visit to her shortly after she um, came home after the accident. And she was sitting at her kitchen table with a notebook and a Webster's dictionary. And I said, are you copying the Webster's? And, and she said, I am getting my adjectives back. She was going through page by page and finding adjectives. And she still had all of her nouns. And, uh, <laughs> and, her, and her verbs, thank God, were there. Uh, but, but she had lost the adjectives. And I've talked with two or three other people since the book came out who have said, this happened to me or this happened to a friend of mine. Um, so it's not, it's not unheard of. But I, I don't understand the physics. I don't understand the neural procedures there. Um, but I would not have thought of that if that hadn't happened. And, and it became something that really defined Virgil and his progress through the world. Um, so thank you for asking that question. One over here, Jerry. For an observation okay. and a question. Um, but I just wanted to notice that I became engaged with the book almost immediately. But it was very slow going for me at first, which is sort of unusual. And then as I got farther into the book, like maybe like three quarters of the way, it started to, I mean, gradually it, it moved. <laughs> 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 some sense if I think about it because it's told in first person. Um, so he's using the personal pronoun and, and, uh, and, and sort of engaging you to do the same in a way. Um, so that does make some sense. Uh, you're not the only one who found the book slow. Um, <laughs> that's, you know, it, it's a character novel for sure. 
It's a, it's a book about about a handful of characters that I, I got to know really well while I was, um, and to me, I mean, look, the, the book is 100 pages shorter than it was when I sent it to my publisher because um, my editor said, uh, I, I love it all, but more needs to happen or less pages need to be here. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and I totally agreed and we, we cut out some things. Um, Ironically, what we mostly cut out was some action that wasn't really germane to the, to the people. Instead of trying to make it move faster, uh, we took out, you ever go to an action movie and you're just bored to tears? This happens to me all the time. It's like you go to a superhero movie and two hours in you're just, oh my gosh! <laughs> and they're flying around in their spaceships and I'm just, just bored. Because I don't care about the characters. And, uh, so I guess maybe it was the only kind of book I could write at the time. I, I had these people in my mind, and I, um, I just let them sort of spool out. Um, so given that very little actually happens in the story, I'm delighted that you are all here. <laughs> Thank you for that observation. I think I read the book three or four times because I kept reading the pages over and over again because I thought the descriptions were so beautiful. I have a question. In the copy that you deleted, was the kite in that? Yeah. Yeah, there were kites in the first, in the first version, too. Um, you know, the kites are... Can I just take a minute and talk about the kites? Because, um, because the kites were sort of a big motivator for me. Um, and, 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 and kite flying is a, um, one of those things in my life that is both really uh, real and, and, and also kind of metaphorically uh, important and helpful to me. When I was in junior high, um, it's, it's no big deal to anyone to say, I was in junior high and life was miserable. Let's just admit, <laughs> the junior high is basically hell. Um, and, and so it was no different for me than for anybody else. Um, but in seventh grade, uh, there, I, I would get to school early because my dad was the band director. So I would ride with dad, so I didn't have to ride the bus. And, and I'd get there an hour before school started. And then I would, I would go out and wander the hallways. Well, there were three or four upperclassmen who liked to get there early so they could make my life hard. Uh, and this again, this is, I mean, everybody has something like this, right? Um, and, and they, you know, they didn't beat me up. There was just always this threat, this dread. It's like, what is going to happen here? Um, and, and what happened for me was, that um, I didn't want to, didn't want to hide the band room because my dad was there. And then I'm hiding with my dad. That's not going to make my life easier. So I would go out, and, and what I discovered was that the school librarian would open the library at about the same time as I would get there. So, what was the one place in school that these three or four guys would not go? <laughs> That's right. They wouldn't go in the library. They weren't. They weren't going to set foot in there. So I would go in the library, and one of the books that that was on the new arrivals desk, and I remember like it was yesterday, was, um, was a book by Will Yolen, father of Jane Yolen, who wrote a lot of great children's books. Uh, Will Yolen had this book called The Complete Book of Kites, Kite Flying. There used to be a lot of titles, The Complete Book of This, The Complete Book of, now with the internet, you don't see that so much. Um, no book is complete, I guess. But, um, but this, this book um, just had a drawing of a kite on the and, uh, and I checked it out immediately. Uh, something about it just, just called to me. I wasn't a huge kite flyer at that point. But I checked the book out, took it home. The first third of it was basically a history of kites, going back 4,000 years to the early Chinese kites. Um, and the second part was Will Yolen's own sort of personal kite flying history. Um, and he told a great story. He was one of these guys. He was a publishing executive, I think, with Simon & Schuster. It was, it was one of the big publishers. And he would leave his, his office at noon with three or four kites under his arm. He walked down to Central Park with a sandwich and three or four kites. And he would just start putting kites in the air. And kids would sort of flock around and, and he'd hand them strings and they'd, they'd fly kites. And he became this, this endearment, this, this beloved guy. And you saw his picture in the back of the book and he, 
he looked like an elf, man. He had, he had neatly trimmed a white mustache, and he had one of those flat caps like duffers wear, you know. And I remember being 13 and thinking, I've got to grow up to be like this guy. <laughs> because it was like he could do anything. And he, he told this story about, about becoming the kite flying champion of New York by, um, by, by winning a kite battle with a bully named Pablo Diablo, <laughs> who, who would call the devil, um, who, would, who would fly these, these, um, these razor blade encrusted kites um, and, and, and cut other people's kite strings. And, and he'd be the, this would be the only kite in the air because he cut everybody else out. Of, and, and, and Willie Yolen defeated Pablo Diablo by outfoxing him with his little lightweight kite that would fly on a rope. And, and I just couldn't get enough of this. So the last third of the book is just kite plans. Here's how you go home to your kitchen table with a roll of paper and some, and some strips of bamboo and you build your own. And I just spent the next three years just building kites at my table. Because for someone like me, it was, it was a good experience. If I was flying a kite, nobody thought, hey, where's Leif? Um, oh, he's flying, a, he's doing something. It was an excuse to be alone that was, um, no, my folks wouldn't worry about me because I was busy doing something real. I was flying kites. Um, and and so I was still kind of a kid, so it wasn't too weird. Uh, so I, to me, that was, when I was flying a kite, what I quickly realized was that I was in touch with something that was big. You know, you put a kite in the air, it feels exactly like you've got a fish on a line. It's exactly the same thing, except it's in the sky. And so I began to feel that, um, that I was in touch with something that was living. Um, a kite and a sailboat, those are the two things I can think of that are inanimate objects until they're activated and then they're alive. Um, if, you're, if you're on the line with a fish and the fish decides to take a run, if it's a large fish, you have to let them run. <coughs> Otherwise, the line will break. But if you let them run, eventually they'll change their minds and allow themselves to be real in. The kite's the same thing. If you put a kite in the air and it, and it suddenly just starts heading for the ground, it just puts its shoulder down, boom, 45 degrees, it's going to go down, it's going to hit the ground, unless you give it 30 or 40 feet of line as fast as you can, almost 100% of the time. That will cause a kite to reconsider. <laughs> put its nose up and regain safety. Um, so it really felt to me that I was on to something. And it still kind of does. Um, I fly kites when I need perspective. And uh, I've done a lot of kite flying in the last couple of years. It's, uh, it's useful. I, I don't travel without a kite in the car. Um, we've, got one, we've got one along now. Might do a little flying tomorrow on the way home. So that's why kites were important, and I, I, I want to ruin my, my old Norwegian to uh, to be the, a purveyor of um, an almost otherworldly or ethereal uh, hope and optimism. And, and kites are natural. There's a uh, there's a scene I really loved writing where. Um, um, Virgil has just come back from, from dinner with Nadine, and, and he's feeling just, yeah, he's excited, he's kind, of, he's kind of full of this feeling of, uh, he's crazy about her. He thinks she might like him back, but he's not sure yet. But he comes back and it's two in the morning or something, and it's snowing outside. And, and he, gets, he walks into the apartment and Rune isn't there, and Rune's outside. He says, come on out, come out. So he goes out and there's, there's a kite in the air and you can't see it. Rune says, you've got to here, just fly the kite. I'm not going to tell you what it is. The idea that, that he's in touch with something that he never knows. He never knows what kite that is. He doesn't know if it's the spirit or he doesn't know if it's the dog or if it's the armchair or the fireplace. He doesn't know. Um, and Rune will never tell him. He's just flown this kite with something unseen. Uh, I, I, I intend to arrange for that to happen at least someday. <laughs> Not sure whether it was as powerful about that, but something is. You can over explain it, you know. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Um, I, my question was going to be um, how do you decide how long a book is going to be? Did you decide on the number of pages? Did it just end? 
um, but you sort of touched on it saying that the editor he said that this book has to be short. Yeah, well, I, you know, in all honesty, um, I know that I'm done with the draft. I'm just in here. I, I, I never think, oh, what if I'm not done? Uh, I've talked with writers who have that experience, but I know when I'm done. Partly because um, my last few pages, uh, in, in Virgil, a thing happened that has never happened to me before, which was for about the last dozen pages, um, I wrote in something um, approximating um, iambic intent. I mean, it, 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 there was a rhythm to it that I, I, I started to think I was going out of my head because I couldn't think in normal sentences. It was so rhythmic. And it's, da, 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 And it just went on and on. Um, and I, I went back. I wrote it that way. And it didn't really work as prose because it was, it was, too, it was too rhythmic. Um, for prose to feel organic, it can't be like that. If you're writing poetry, that's one thing. But I wasn't writing poetry. I was writing, I was writing prose. So I went back and I, and I, I removed that, uh, that element. I kept everything that I had written and I broke it up, um, except for the last paragraph. But I basically let it come out. The last couple of lines, I let it come out. And when I wrote the last couple of lines, I knew this was the end of the book. And then there was no to do. Um, everything was resolved. Um, so that felt, it was nice. It was like putting an exclamation I felt happy about that. And then, of course, I sent the, the whole gigantic manuscript off to Elizabeth. She called and said, I love this. Let's shorten it. <laughs> uh, which I was, I was happy to do. <laughs> yes? So for more than uh, a decade, I've had the honor of serving on our town committee, where we have to choose the name and plan the town festival. And I just want to thank you for hard luck days. <laughs> it just rang so true. <laughs> Hard luck days. Yeah, you know, uh, speaking of festival names, my favorite one I actually cut from the book before I ever sent it in. Um, it was a, you know, foodie festivals are big. And so I had, uh, I had one in which they're, they're focusing on parts of the animal that often aren't used. <laughs> and I called it an awful weekend. In <laughs> actively dying. She was, um, she was very old and she couldn't, her eyes had given out, she couldn't read anymore, but I, would, I read her a, a section and I got to the part where she had been almost unresponsive. Um, she, she couldn't speak very well at that time, but she was listening because when I said an awful weekend in Greenstone, mom just went, <laughs> <laughs> made my day. <laughs> I had a question, but it wouldn't be a spoiler, so. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. just would you, you know, the, the big tension in the whole book is all swirling around that uh, Adam Lear. Yes. Uh, can you tell us, you, were, you wrote, you know, you must have written quite a few volumes. Yeah, that are in the book, go ahead, about this guy. But, uh, yeah, Adam, um, I really enjoyed writing him because Whenever I write a character, I, I, there's something about writing that makes me love my characters. Um, when I was a reporter for, for Minnesota Public Radio, um, this, I, I was still a young guy when I started working for them, so I didn't know that much about human nature. But, um, but I would go to do an interview. They'd send me out to, to visit with someone who I knew I probably disagreed with about everything. <laughs> and, uh, and I would anticipate not liking the person. And then I'd get there, and we'd talk for five minutes, and I'd realize, oh, I kind of like this person. <laughs> and then I'd go, uh, I'd leave, and I'd interview the, the, the person on the other side of whatever ever issue it was, and I'd think, I really like this guy. <laughs> um, and I, on the one hand, it made me feel like I was a complete chameleon. Because I was like, oh, yeah, tell me about that. I just, you know, you don't say it in words, but they must think, this guy's really on my side. Uh, but in fact, I don't think it was being a chameleon so much as it was understanding 
the truth about people, which is that almost all of them are likable. And, and to spend some time with someone and to listen to someone for five or ten minutes is, is to begin to like them. Uh, and the same thing happens with writing. Now with, with Adam, what I knew in advance was that I wanted to write about, uh, Adam's almost a thought experiment because I wanted to write about somebody who wasn't a, who wasn't a whole person. What if they are lacking some of the attributes that make people human beings? What if, what if he has no compassion? What if that's just not there? What if he is not curious about, um, about other people? What if he is not a man with a conscience? Um, if, you, if you make a Faustian deal when you're seven years old, and you sell your soul when you're seven years old, for all practical purposes, then, then what might you be capable of later on? What envelope can you push? Uh, what rules can you break in, until you don't even know that you're breaking them anymore? You're just, you're just living according to your own law. Uh, what would a person be like? <laughs> so I don't have a lot of compassion for that. Uh, and yet I did find that he was um, compelling to write. He was, I enjoyed writing him because I never knew what he was going to say. Or what he was going to do or what he, what he would. Um, he was a surprise continually. Um, and I, I enjoyed seeing him develop. You notice, at some point, I didn't know this until Robin pointed it out to me. I, I, read, her, I read her some sections as I was going along, and about three-fourths of the way through, she said, do you realize that whenever Lear is on stage, that, that whoever has an encounter with him, later something bad happens? Maybe really soon something bad? And I was only about halfway through the book then. And, and I had not realized that. That was happening just organically without my understanding it. But then, once she pointed it out, I was able to sort of say, oh, yeah, well, I can use this. And, uh, and so then, that, that really helped me plot the rest of the book. Um, the, the balance to that was Ruin. When anyone had an encounter with Ruin, when they had the, the privilege of flying one of his kites, it, it gave them a lift, as though they were kites themselves. Um, and that was easy to do, and I did it on purpose, because whenever I need a lift, that's what I do. I go put something up there, and then I feel better. Um, thank you for asking about, about that. Yes? One final question, and then we'll do the raffle. So. Okay. Well, with the same characters in the deleted scenes, do you and in the finished book? Some of, yeah, in the deleted book, the question is, were the same characters in the, in the book I, I threw away? Uh, many of them were. Um, Nadine was, was in it. Um, and, and Virgil was in it, although his name was Roy, and he was not the narrator. Uh, that, that early draft was, there's a very elegant way to construct a novel, which is to tell it from many points of view. And, uh, and, and chapter by chapter, the, the voice sort of goes along to different people. Um, generally in third person. And so my first draft was, was done that way. But it, and it was a frustration to me. I would read Louise Erdrich and I'd think, oh man, this is a great, beautiful way to construct a book. Um, I will do that. But it didn't work for this story. Uh, when I threw it out, I realized that I had to just choose a character to narrate and then let them tell the story from beginning to end. And that way, John Gardner um, wrote a tremendous number of good novels before he was, was killed um, at the age of 49. John Gardner said um, that, that good fiction is like a vivid, continuous dream. And I wanted to write a novel that, that was vivid and continuous. And when I split it up that way, it was jarring. Um, and I didn't want it to be jarring. I wanted it to be uh, something that that people wouldn't put down because suddenly there was a, a different voice that they didn't care for as much. I've read a lot of books like that where, oh, as, as long as it follows this character, I'm in. As soon as it goes to that character, I'm, I'm taken out of it somehow. And I didn't, I didn't want that to be the case. And I thought people would like Virgil's story. Thank you so much. I'm, I guess we have to wrap this up. Thank you all for coming.